Good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to welcome everybody and thank you for joining us this afternoon at today's Rose to Research presentation. Um, we'd also like to welcome those that are joining us remotely. Before we start, um, just a note to everybody that we'll be live streaming the presentation and we'll be recording it for the purposes of social media. So ask some good questions, participate in the discussion, and uh, hopefully really give us uh, some good conversation today. One of the things that uh, we feel as a group that makes Royal Roads special is that Royal Roads does sit on the unceded territory of the Esquimalt and Lekwungen nations. And we are very happy to be continuing the tradition of those people to live, work, and gather, and discuss ideas, and exchange uh, our learning on these, uh, on these lounge, grounds. Um, so today we are pleased to welcome uh, our panel from the School of Environment Sustainability. Um, we will be chatting with Dr. Ann Dale, uh, Dr. Rob Newell, uh, Dr. Matt Dodd and Dr. Hillary Layton to share some ideas for uh, climate change and some of the great challenges as well as some of the sort of scarier bits. Um, but looking forward, I think, with some ideas about where we can go from here. Um, our event this afternoon is sponsored by the Canadian Tri-Agency uh, Tri Research Support Fund um, and uh, they continue to provide all kinds of support to climate change research in Canada. So many of you will be familiar with the, uh, the recent reports that have come out that the planet is warming faster than, than we had anticipated, um, that we have a limited amount of time before we start to see some major changes in biodiversity. Um, but it's not the only thing that's going on and how we look at the, the research that's done across disciplines gives us a lot of clues to some of the things that we might do going forward in order to change how some of these things are working on. So first off, um, Anne, you're the PI for a six-year climate change project, MC3, Meeting the Climate Change Challenge. Can you tell us a little bit about what, you're, what you and your team have been up to? Uh, is this working? Yeah, it is working. Okay, and just before I comment on that, um, this is going to be interactive, isn't it, Dr. Noble? So it is. We will die, we'll be discussing between ourselves, but with you. So if you have questions in between. Um, please do step up to the mic if you've got a question, and that way we can deal with, uh, deal with folks. And we will also be, um, have the ability to take some questions from those that are online that are joining us via live stream. Okay, so the first thing we've been doing is trying to stay out of trouble, and we've been fairly successful so far. We've just returned from Vancouver, where we made uh, three presentations at EcoCity, four presentations, if, if I can remember at this stage. We came back late last night. So we presented, it was the wrap-up of MC3, a seven-year research project on climate change adaptation and mitigation. And I think I mentioned to some of you that I'm now using the IPCC language of climate pollution, which I think is a far better way to communicate the issue rather than trying to discriminate between adaptation and mitigation. So we have, uh, we researched 11 innovate, leading innovate, innovator communities in British Columbia, a longitudinal study, and we did an awful lot of research. We had a lot of discussions on how to change current development paths, the meaning of change, how to unpack change, and uh, not surprisingly, leadership is really important. How you frame the issue. So those communities who frame the issue more narrowly initially as energy efficiency, and then showed the benefits and co-benefits of acting simply on energy efficiency, were then able to successfully enlarge the agenda more to sustainability. Now, I must highlight to you that if you aim for sustainability, climate change is actually a co-benefit. But if you aim only for climate change, sustainability doesn't necessarily follow. So then we looked at a whole bunch of things, things that are really important, policy congruence between levels of government, uh, uh, policy and policy alignment within government departments, taking advantage of a crisis. There was one uh, municipal uh, staff member who took her council counselor to see the flooding 
And that then prompted a conversation on climate change and flooding and wildfires and so far. So direct action. And then um, I, I, I'd like to highlight the importance of having standardized government policies, in, instruments and incentives, which help to propel BC forward. And then the last thing, because I'm taking up a lot of space here, dear moderator, is that it is really important to institutionalize and embed those changes you want because um, in government departments so that you can avoid swinging from left to right in an into highly polarized debate. For example, the carbon tax implementation here in BC, many academics argued that it should go into a general revenue pot in order to fund more climate change innovations and actions, but by giving it back to individuals, when we move to a more conservative administration, there's no way they could take the carbon tax back. What they did was delay the increases in it, but it was now embedded and successful. Thank you. Okay. So to swing a little bit from that perspective, Matt, what's the big deal about the contaminants and are they getting worse and how is that related? So um, thanks. Um, I work with uh, contaminants in the environment, uh, mostly looking at uh, persistent organic pollutants, which we call the legacy contaminants, and then metals. And um, when I got out of university, I had a chance to work in the Canadian Arctic, looking at uh, pollutants like DDT, PCVs, and um, or, um, what we call the persistent, because they don't degrade in the environment. And eventually um, identified the fact, I uh, worked with a group of the Northern Contaminants Working Group, identified the fact that these contaminants are moving into the Arctic ecosystems and affecting uh, human and environmental health. And eventually uh, led to the Montreal, well, not the Montreal Protocol, the Stockholm Convention of uh, Organic Pollutants, which led to the ban of these contaminants in the environment. And because of some of these international pollutants, the short answer to the question is the levels of these contaminants in the Canadian Arctic are going down. And not only that, if you look at the Great Lakes and all around the world, the levels of these uh, pollutants are, are diminishing. And so that's the good news in the fact that uh, back then when we identified all these pollutants, um, policies were set in place and led to the reduction of these contaminants in the environment. And apart from the international uh, conventions, we also have improvement in environmental regulations and legislations, which have led to the decrease of these uh, contaminants in the environment. And so in short, the levels generally are going down. And um, maybe later on we can tie into what's happening in terms of climate change and impacts. I don't know whether I can continue on that trend or but to use an example in terms of the impact, um, one of the sites that I worked at, uh, it was an old shell exploration site. And uh, when they finished the exploration, they, in the old days, this was in the old days, in the uh, 70s, 60s, they took all the leftover um, equipment, including barrels of DDT, and buried it in a landfill, in a floodplain. The river was way over about 200, kilometer, uh, 200 mi um, meters away. And with changes in the um, climate system and rivers changing courses, the river changed course and went right into the landfill. And so in the end, we had to uh, go and assess and remediate the site, remove all the barrels that were, that, uh, that were buried in the, in the site, which at the time they thought was a safe place. So with the changing dynamics in the climate and frequent impacts and flooding and things like that, we see um, contaminants being released into the environment. And so although the levels are changing, there are instances where we've got impacts because of these climate changes impacting the sites that we've been looking at. Okay. Rob, can you tell us a little bit about what your research has been dealing with with the MC3 group? Sure. Um, Anne mentioned uh, co-benefits. This is uh, climate action co-benefits. Uh, the, these are things that I've been focusing on um, a fair bit in the research. And I think it's worthwhile just talking about what these are. Um, probably a lot of people saw this comic that was um, uh, put out uh, about a decade ago from Joel Pett, where there's this conference, uh, a presentation, 
where a person was presenting on all the benefits of climate action, looking at you know green space, healthy air, uh, healthy water, green jobs. And then there's this person in the crowd that was saying, um, what happens if this climate change thing all turns out to be a hoax and we made the world a better place for no reason, right? So. In a nutshell, it actually that really captures what co-benefits are about. Um, they're really the community or societal benefits that come from climate action that extend beyond adaptation or mitigation. So uh, the ex example I like to use, because it really resonates with a lot of people, you make a community more walkable, um, then you are taking, well, Theoretically, you're taking cars off the road, so you're reducing emissions in that way. It's a good mitigation strategy. Same time, too, you have more people walking, so you have a healthier community. Um, if you integrate these pedestrian trails within green space, you can also do wonderful things for mental health. There might be areas you can put in for social interaction. Really, when it's, what it comes down to is you can actually do climate action without even saying you're doing climate action. It's just kind of a, a way of looking at climate action in a more a um, uh, holistic sense. So you can do climate action and achieve multiple sustainability goals, multiple, multiple social, economic, and environmental goals. Co-benefits kind of seem like win-win situations. So in some ways, it's almost like, well, why aren't we always doing these strategies? But it's not always the case. A lot of these do actually have trade-offs to them, too. Um, if you densify a city, sure that it could do great things as far as making things more efficient for transportation and building energy. Same time, too, what happens is you might get uh, much taller buildings that affects people's sense of place, the character of place. So the reasons why people live and love their community. So that can be a significant trade-off. Now. To better understand then how we can maximize these co-benefits and uh, also recognize and address these trade-offs, the project that we worked on was a climate action co-benefits modeling thing where we ended up mapping the relationships between climate action strategies, benefits, um, and also those trade-offs and challenges. And these created these maps that were, were, what we're arguing um, can be used as tools for integrated planning, people planning in a more integrated sense, understanding how climate action is a piece of this larger, really important policy puzzle, but also it is a very in integral piece of this puzzle and a lot of the other things you want to achieve about uh, healthy communities, uh, local green space, they're very tightly related to climate action. So that's kind of one of the things that we worked on. We did have a lunch and learn session with uh, the city of Vancouver and it seemed like these can be used as tools just for thinking about the advantages and disadvantages of uh, doing different climate action strategies. Okay. I just want to add, and another cool benefit of getting more people out walking is you get more people meeting each other, right? So you get enhanced social capital. So as many of you know, Putman, Putman asked in 2001, do you want more police or do you want more people knowing their neighbors? And another great way to meet people is walking your dog as well. Let's hang on to that. Okay, so building on, on that sort of social capital piece a little bit, Hillary, would you like to tell us how eco-psychology fits in this puzzle Thanks. as well? Is this on? Yes. Well, um, in 1993, Neil Everenden said, it isn't an environmental crisis. We are the environmental crisis. And as an eco-psychologist, how I see climate pollution is I see it first as something that's, that I am, that I'm part of the climate pollution problem, that possibly my inner life is somewhat polluted, or my perceptions of myself in relationship to the world is somewhat muddied. So uh, one of my great teachers, Joanna Macy, says, this might not be a climate crisis as much as it's a, climate, uh, a, a crisis of perception. And as a psychotherapist, I say, let's not waste a good crisis, especially if it's a midlife crisis, because this is the opportunity for us to also look at our own contributions, our own shadowy past, our own ways of being. It's easy enough to all know what we should do. Uh, we're, we, you know, we're all very clever people sitting in this room. We know the science. We know what is needed to be done. And yet, why don't we change? So there's something there for us about um, I think there's still a lot of work to be done, especially academically, to bring this into the discourse of how we are these permeable membranes. We're actually so interconnected. Our indigenous brothers and sisters know this from their traditional teachings. Many artists and poets have always spoken about this invisible kind of webbiness that occurs. Now science is talking that way, has been talking that way. This is a time for us to understand that everything we do Every single thing we do makes a difference. And so how can we look at our values, our actions, our behaviors, 
and not just look at the problems per se, but also look at ways we can thrive because it's really port important for how we're going to move forward with the question, how are we going to be? And how are we going to be with each other? So as odd as this may seem, my faith is in humans. <laughs> you know, most people don't have faith in humans. We have a lot of shame and blame going on. And I think we're all in the same boat. We're all complicit. As much as we're all participating, if you're here in this room, it's because you want something different to happen. You're probably deeply invested in your future and this planet that you live on. But also, we're all participating in the demise of this planet. So this is a really tricky conversation. And I believe this involves the human soul as much as it involves our beautiful rational minds. So I'm interested in bringing soul back into the discourse. And sometimes that's through art and arts-based learning. It's also through uh, nature-based connections and practices that we may have forgotten that feel very uh, natural, pun intended, and human uh, when we engage in them. So it's uh, really bringing our learning and teaching model to life through experiential learning and really pushing the edges of um, academia a bit. Okay. Yeah. Matt. Just added a thought on that. Um, I don't know who, where I heard this from, but someone said that. I am, therefore, I pollute. And so I see the world that way, that I am a polluter. And so every little thing that, that I can do to reduce my footprint helps. Okay. Thanks. All right. So one of the, the pieces that hopefully we see through this is we've got a theme where, you know, we hope that our research is informing policy and we hope that our research is acting as a vehicle for change so that people have some new ideas and explore some new ideas about the things we can do with regard to planning, with regard to community, with regard to science, with regard to taking that longer view of not just what impact am I going to have right now, but what impact is what I'm doing going to have down the road. Um, and just sort of building on this, uh, and one of the things that we've noted is the IPCC report really takes a, a pretty solid view that right now, all of this change is all about political will. How do you see that building going forward? Thanks for the simple question, Mickey. <laughs> uh, I am, therefore I pollute. I'm going to put that as a signature line. I really like that because that ties into climate pollution, right? Um, yeah, I do think it's all about political will, and I'm, I, I've said to some of you I'm very heartened by the climate strikes and the hundreds of thousands of people that went out, marched, and I'm, I, it's going to be very interesting to see if that translates into any electrical dif differences on October the 21st. Um, one of the things that m European researchers are coalescing around, and we've just built a new research proposal on this, is the notion of multi-level governance. That is, you need multiple levels of governance working together because the scale of the problem, of course, is global. So how the hell then do you connect local to national to global? And that's achieved through multi-level gov governance. And we need new institution, uh, institutional arrangements to move to what we say is a carbon neutral economy by 2030. It's doable, it's feasible, but we need tremendous change at the political level. So we have in, in BC, our climate in, innovation was accelerated because we had incredible alignment and leadership from the provincial government prior to 2012, was it when the government changed? Yeah, 2012. Provincial and local governments were working together, and we worked in partnership with the Climate, uh, Change, Action Secret Climate Change Secretariat here in BC. And in fact, they commissioned us to write a scientific report on the, our, our findings, which we did, 10-page policy synthesis. We went to every political party, but timing is everything in life, right? We've got these, these huge electrical, electrical electoral changes so the administration changed and we sort of lost momentum but we're picking up again so uh, then in Ontario but we had no federal context because it was the Harper administration in Ontario conversely we had tremendous federal uh, leader leadership when the carbon tax was first introduced it subsequently changed dynamically uh, coupled with provincial leadership but no connection to the local so what we need is that multi-level governance, new institutional arrangements,
but we also need the ability to connect what civil society is doing to shift the, the locus of power and control from governments to governance, which includes civil society, leaders and actors, and this is kind of wordy, but quasi-institutional intermediaries. So like a, an example of that in BC is the Fraser Basin. I think in Ontario it would be the Great Lakes Association. So um, we need everybody to vote. Uh, we need everybody to start speaking up. We need everybody to start community conversations on the issues and particularly, I would argue, biodiversity conservation as well. There's no second chance from extinction. So we've got two challenges, two key imperatives, climate pollution and biodiversity conservation. And I think it's possible. I think it's doable, but it's going to take us to make those make. As one politician said to me, and as long as I think it's going to count as a vote, I'll change. <laughs> okay. So that's a great jumping off point. So Hillary, what do you think is really going to be needed to move that, to move that political will so we, we hit that 1.5 degree target? Well, I'll, I have to back way up from that. Oops, sorry. I have to back way up from that because I'm just thinking about um, our particularity. I'm thinking about, I was just looking out this way and looking at the trees and thinking, yes, that might be, uh, you know, arbutus or fir, but they're all, each tree is particular, just as each human has our, we each have our own particularity. We're all born with our own proclivities and powers and passions. And I think if we're not willing to kind of clear out some of the, mm, the disavowed aspects of ourselves, our, um, you know, our separation or our, our perceptions of separation from the rest of the world, then it, it won't be clear on how we'll act. So political will will be another concept. It'll be just another thing we have to do. I think the connection point has to be a deeper, more sensual, more emotionally connected aspect of ourselves to the world to really see something. Um, it's, many people are saying it took me to have grandchildren to really realize that, that you know, we're, we're, something's really happening here, that these ones won't have a planet to inhabit. I think there has to be, um, for each one of us, a deeper connection to how we're to serve, contribute, participate in this world uh, as members of this world rather than as apart from, but as part of. And I think when that happens, then we don't even have to talk about political will because then we're going to do the right thing. We just know we want clean air and clean water and beautiful lands to live on and we want to work in community. And what Anne's talking about is radical collaboration. And that does happen when people are deeply invested in um, you know, this planet. I think the personal is the planetary and vice versa. I just do. I think it's all so deeply connected. Uh, but we often don't talk about that. We say, you know, just vote or just do this. And I think there's something deeper here. It's a psychological piece about being, you know, more connected to the <laughs> psyche of Gaia, to be more connected to this beautiful biosphere uh, that we live on. Um, I don't know if any of you guys saw the Will Smith documentary, Strange Rock. It's pretty interesting. I don't agree with all of it, but it's an interesting documentary series. And the astronauts who are up in space, and some of them are up for like five or six hundred days, and like their bodies, their bones are changing, which I find odd. But, you know, this is what happens. We become alien when we're away from our planet home. But they look back and they see this swirling, beautiful blue mass, and there are no boundaries, and there are no fences, and no colors, and no bank accounts, and no degrees. There's nothing there keeping us from each other. This is this beautiful, swirling mass of aliveness. And they say, boy, if everyone could see this, we would change. We wouldn't have all of this, uh, you know, this difference making such a difference in our lives, uh, this polarity. Um, but it, it doesn't work that way. I think this is an inside-out job. And I think we've ignored that. We think it's something external that's going to shift things. And I think we need to do our own personal work as well, in tandem with all of this other good work that's happening. And I see Anne grabbing the microphone. So I'm putting mine down now. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you feel sorry for me working with such diverse personalities? What I, w I, 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 
you know, this sort of personal touchy-feely stuff, I don't mean to minimize what Hillary's saying. I think it's really important, that being in touch with the personal. But what I wanted to add to that, I don't know if you agree. We, I think we all come from blaming and shaming and connecting to political will. So if you look at the attention in the recent uh, electoral discussion on Trudeau's blackface, it was the media attention on that to me was mind blogging, bogging, because it gets to that, you know, script we're all sort of used to, blaming and shaming. You know, Alberta's this, BC's so much better. That's all crap. That's all designed, I think, to keep us mired in inaction and in the old stories. When you've got the twin imperatives that like we are talking about today, I mean, yeah, sure, devote maybe a day to blackface and then let's move on. And where's the substantive discussion? Where is, this is an opportunity for us as Canadians to talk about what's important for us and how much political time is being spent for that, on that. Very, very, very little. So we might also want to turn our attention to media. So I think that that connection between the personal and the political, and as you were saying, Hillary, the, the natural world. You know, I, I, this is gonna sound really hokey and I've said this to some of you. After it rains and you're rushing to a meeting uh, and there's a worm wriggling still semi-alive on the pavement. Well, when I take the time to move the worm over to the grass, I get empowered. When I step on it, I lose something. Okay. Rob, how do you think we can build that kind of movement going forward? Right, where we're really trying to get people to connect with just each other as well as the ideas in order to make those changes. Sure. Um, yeah, so I think I might um, shift gears a little bit and talk a little bit more about uh, the, the integrated planning because um, it does make a, a, a beautiful concept, uh, this idea of being able to integrate like climate action into all these other wonderful goals of creating a, a community and society that we think is like is a lovely place to be. And then, but, but going back to that earlier thing, this thing that I was saying about if this is win-win, why are we not doing it? Part of the reason is that um, it's, you kind of need the tools, you need the strategy to be able to pull this off. We're dealing with complexity here. Integrated planning, sure, it sounds great on paper. Let's uh, plan in a way where we think about um, you know, making a, uh, a better place that is uh, socially, economically, environmentally better. Um, but think about all the complexity and the, the bits and pieces and all the connections that are involved in there. So we need tools such as these systems models, things that we work with, um, to be able to kind of facilitate thinking around that. This being said, those tools are only as good um, as they align with people's values and their interests and their, and their beliefs. A lot of the research that I try and do is trying to um, bring people in right at the beginning, making these processes participatory right at the beginning to design these tools. It's very tempting for a researcher just to go ahead and create a systems model that could be quite useful for saying, hey, if we develop this way, this is what it means for threats to habitat, um, access to amenities, for local employment, so forth. Um, but ultimately, the, uh, the stuff that we're trying to do is, uh, these processes, is trying to make it right at the beginning, have these discussions with the community and say, what do you actually want to see in these models? What are likely futures that you want to explore? What are like different community development scenarios? So there definitely is potential for using these tools, but I think uh, it's important for us to kind of step back and not uh, stop thinking of ourselves as just the experts. The knowledge experts are the people that are affected by these places. And if you want to make it relevant and useful and something that people actually want to use, then you do have to kind of involve them into the research process right at the beginning. So that systems model is one thing I work with. I also work with visualizations, make these tools that uh, you talk to people and say, what do you actually want to see in these sort of visualizations? What are the types of things you want to explore with it? And so I think that's kind of maybe one way of being able to bridge that, uh, that these ideas to practice. Yeah. Can I jump in here a little bit yeah. for a moment? Thanks. Can I add a question at your end then? Sure. Hillary, you're an expert in convening people. So can you give us some tips about, uh, tell us about that please? After sure. finish. Yeah, sure. Uh, what I was just thinking about, Rob, when you were just talking about um, you know, what a beautiful thing to get a community together, to bring in, you know, as Anne would say, all the unusual suspects and, you know, just bring in all the voices at the table because there's such richness there and that's part of the convening end that we enjoyed. We all enjoyed this in the MEM program, the open space last Friday. It was content generated by students with really rich, diverse topics, but, and, not but, 
Um, Rob, I was just thinking, you know, what we're missing often at the table when we have the community discussion, and this might, you know, sound to some a little bit too far, far out, and so I'll push the edges. Who's there to speak for the trees? Who's there to speak for the squirrels? Who's there to speak for the rivers? I mean, now we're starting to see the beautiful benefits of David Boyd's work from UBC, the rights of nature, as he's worked tirelessly with a team of, um, you know, legal experts and lawyers to, um, you know, help uh, different countries denote personhood to rivers and parks and lakes so that these ones can actually show, show up at the table represented by often traditional peoples who see themselves so deeply connected with a river or a lake or, you know, um, or a, a, you know, a forest that they can't imagine themselves living without it because they're not just like the river, they are river. They have watershed thinking, watershed mentality. And so when we're convening these spaces, we often are very human-centric. And so we can have best ideas, but inadvertently we're missing something if we're not including the rest of the world. I don't know how to do that. So, I mean, it sounds a little bit crazy, but I think that's sometimes what we're missing. And I'll just use a quick example of our beautiful institute here. We can be sitting at the table and be smart as whips and get some great ideas, but where are the students? And, you know, that's an obvious, but we can forget sometimes. Or where is the land? Or where are the first peoples that were here? We don't often invite them to the conversation. So I wonder how we can be better as conveners, better um, as inviters, you know, to bring more participation rather than what ends up is well-meaning manipulation. We get what we want, but yet we haven't had full participation. I don't know, I'm just riffing on No, that. I mean, I'd, and I'd love to actually respond to that because um, I'd also add too um, that, sure, I mean, I do actually organize a lot of uh, community focus groups, invite people to the table, but is everyone actually there to speak for themselves? Well, no, I mean, in any group, focus group that I put together, any meeting that I put together, not everyone is going to be able to show up to the table. They might be busy or they might just not even feel fully comfortable with the project or whatever I'm doing at the first time. So what does that mean? It means that uh, if I want my tools to be participatory, if I want these things to be um, really inclusive of community ideas and values, you kind of have to make them flexible and understand that these are iterative processes. They evolve. So working with like systems models, working with visualizations, um, and like any other sort of planning tools, they, have, they need to be things that you can design in there, that they're flexible, you can update them, you can add to them, as more people get the opportunity to speak and get their ideas and their values in. Making them as like living, uh, developing tools that you know over the time span, more and more they'll actually represent uh, the relevant, uh, the needs of values, actually a bit better representation of the community and also all the kind of biotic factors of the community too. How deliciously messy. So yeah. I'll answer uh, Anne's question about convening <laughs> yeah. and just say, yeah, if we can imagine spaces that are open, open enough for all voices, for all to be represented and to sometimes read for the absences, like who is not in this room? You know, there's an onus on all of us sitting at a table making decisions to look around and say, who is not here? And what is missing? Just to kind of um, create those, um, you know, those, and, and have many times we get together because you're right. That's where we get these rich layers of people. Sometimes it takes people a little bit of courage to show up and hear that something was not scary and that their voice was needed at the table. Did I answer your convening question, Anne? Or? <laughs> yes, yes, you did. Uh, thank you, Hillary. And I, I just want to add um, an experiment we did with the MC3. So we were deeply committed to communicating our research uh, findings. And I'd like to acknowledge that another member of our team who is here, Francois Jost, a uh, postdoctoral fellow working with us as well, but we wanted to sort of highlight the school, so that's why he's not up here. So we um, got together the research team with uh, political leaders. Uh, we did six of them, and they were virtual, a private space, you know, because adults, research shows adults learn most from their peers and they want safe places because you don't want to appear stupid as an adult. Quite often we don't admit to not understanding something, so we'll put the file to the side until we can get to it later. So we brought the research team together, many of whom were very, very experienced and articulate from other universities, with elected officials in these private um, luncheon meetings, and we, you know, as a little treat, offered to buy their lunch after, afterwards. Um, tremendously successful and we got a little bit more sophisticated because then we took 
the political leader who was leading innovator in those conversations and then brought them into the second one, into the third, into the fourth, into the fifth. Uh, we don't have hard evidence, but we have antidote. I can never pronounce that. <laughs> Anecdotal. Anecdotal. Thank you, <laughs> colleagues. Uh, evidence that one community then started to to initiate climate innovations, and we started to accelerate. Unfortunately, we couldn't keep it up because the transaction costs, because of the time constraints of elected officials, was too great for us as researchers. But it's those kinds of, I think, um, different kinds of physical places and virtual places. But if we don't start the conversation, if we have no space for the conversations from the, from the media, from elected officials, from shrinking down CBC. Well, I'll just go back to, is Craig Axford here from MEM? No. Well, uh, what I learned from Craig uh, when I was talking to him at the poster presentation uh, and what I was just reminded of is the way he's uh, performing his research is to go into traditional people's territories and listen, to first listen. I think we're often so keen on getting our questions answered that if we can also show up in spaces that are open enough to allow us to listen first and start to hear some of what's going on before we meet our agenda, that sometimes that can even change our agenda or change our questions. And I want to be still willing to be changed. I have lots of opinions and lots of ideas, and I, I also want to be able to be humble uh, in a situation where I'm with a lot of other people and be willing to be changed uh, by what I hear and what I witness. So I, I think we need to convene spaces that are also sensitive to the different ways that people converse and communicate and maybe share their knowledge. So um, I think we have a bit of work to do there too in communication. Leo Takash is in the house. Sure, so. of course, we're delighted. We're I'm tired of listening can, to each other. Come to the mic so you can be heard. No, just set it down gently. So uh, my name's Schwab, I'm from the third year MEM program. I was just gonna, like, when you guys were talking about communication and how to get the, the message across, right? Like our, our class watched um, the leaders debate together um, a few days ago, right? And one of the things that I think stuck out was that, like how do you answer these complex questions about, you know, uh, in 45 second, you know, uh, uh, in 45 seconds, right? So it seems like the debate now, like, you know, we've elected, and this kind of touches on a few things that you were talking about, like, like Anne was talking about how getting different levels of government to work together um, to, to address these issues. But the challenge seems to be like right now, in the current reality in Canada, is that you have, you'll have one level of government that's completely offside, right? And people are electing these governments, which is, which is interesting. Right? Like, I'm from Calgary. We just elected a government that, you know, declared that job number one was going to be to, to eliminate the carbon tax, the job-killing carbon tax. Um, Ontario as well, they eliminated the cap-and-trade system. Um, so it seems like in the age that we're living in now, like you guys were both talking about communication, right? In the age we're living in now, it seems like there's a lot of misinformation out there in terms of, you know, the, you know, the, the carbon tax uh, itself or other, you know, climate policies and, you know, in the age of sound bites and in the age of, you know, um, Twitter, you know, tw 280 characters or whatever it is, um, you know, it seems like you can't really have these discussions with people and, you know, politics in full sentences. Um, so, like, what do you guys think in terms of uh, how to get that dialogue and actually have a meaningful conversations and to actually, you know, further the conversation with, with facts, not just, you know, sound bites? Okay. Um, Who wants to take that one? Matt, do you want to maybe start with some of the, the challenges with communicating some of the science content when we're trying to get some of these conversations going? Yeah, and, I, and I think um, one of the challenges, as you mentioned, is letting people know um, in terms of the content what is true and what's not. And uh, usually, personally, I find that begins at a grassroots level. If you, for example, um, uh, working with kids, um, if you let them know, and then pass on to parents. And I brought this up because uh, we've been doing some work in um, Ghana, and one of the biggest issues in some of these countries are plastic pollution. Uh, people, adults, eating, throwing plastics around. And so 
as the kids uh, learn not to do it, they pass on information to the adults and then the adults pass it on. So my take is beginning at the grassroots levels. And, um, and one of the other things I like doing is trying to explain the science to grammar. So if you can explain your point to grammar, it's a good starting point. Because if my grandma, who didn't know a lot of the science, when, uh, can understand it, then it makes it more um, accessible. So basically, um, my take is at the grassroots levels. Because high up, um, people don't usually don't listen. But if you start at the grassroots level and then filter up the chain. Yeah, I mean, uh, along with that line too, <coughs> And uh, granted, I, f I feel this is kind of uh, relates a little bit more to the participatory stuff that I was uh, mentioning before. Um, but one of the case studies we had was called Eagle Island. It's a small community in uh, West Vancouver. Um, there was a resident there, Chair Stratford, that um, saw, you know, this is over a decade ago, saw the inconvenient truth and then, uh, you know, felt um, uh, inspired to get the community together to go chat about ways that we can make our community a bit more energy efficient. Really, um, what actually came out of this, or what, uh, what the strategy was, was inviting people over and having dinner parties. So it was just these parties with a purpose type thing where people can actually have a conversation. And this is kind of part of the problem, I think, with a lot of the communication we're seeing nowadays. People aren't necessarily feeling like they're being heard. It's just kind of people, um, you know, shooting out uh, without necessarily thinking that their voice is going to be heard back. Whereas this case, you actually had a bit of a platform to dis discuss a little bit, um, you know, the things that they want to see in their future and what is feasible. How can we actually do it together? It sort of gives uh, both, like all sides and all parties a little bit of agency. I really do think there's a lot more common ground than we give ourselves credit for. It's just, it, it's trying to get past that initial barrier of just uh, the us versus them type thing. And if you can find those platforms where you're saying, hey, what is it? that we value, um, then you probably can find a, a more, a better direction forward. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Oh, in the Eagle Island, yeah, there is uh, certainly some people that still just didn't show up to the parties, but um, I think they ended up getting something like 80% of the houses retrofitted. It was such a, um, uh, a an interesting initiative that even the, the, the city of West Van decided that they were going to jump on board and give them a lot more resources to be able to do thermal imagery, uh, you know, get uh, bulk retrofit. So they, it was a, very much a grassroots example. I like to use it a fair bit when I teach classes because it shows, I mean, Tara Stratford was just a, she was just a citizen of Eagle Island and it really showed that just um, her passion, her drive um, could make these things happen and you can have those community government partnerships that sometimes seem so hard to obtain. Right, and so never underestimating this, the power of conversation. It seems small, but these small things just spread. This is the way that things actually become contagious and spread. And I, I'd say the other thing is be an antidote to those, uh, to Twitter. Be an antidote, you know, have a conversation with people. We feed this machine. It's not, you know, it's not some monster out there that's just, you know, happening. We all feed this by subscribing, by contributing to it, by not stopping ourselves because it's addictive and actually having, you know, convening a discussion and, you know, getting folks together and starting to ask some of these really important critical questions. If you're wrestling with something in your own inner dialogue, it's likely there's a whole bunch of other people that are working on, you know, having that work them too. And so I think what we're failing to do is remind ourselves that even something like the kitchen table, like you're talking about with dinner parties, those are the greatest conversations that can happen in a family when we learn from each other. And we're kind of missing that convening of simply sharing a meal together and um, seeing what comes up, you know. And oh, slowing down a little. Yeah. No, there's a question over there. I much prefer. Oh, Robin, welcome. Um, thanks. Uh, I was just thinking, uh, Robin um, Cox from uh, Disaster Emergency Management Program here. Anyway, I, I'm thinking of the Alberta Narratives Project, and if you haven't played around with that, you know, which which builds from part of what you're saying, which is which is all about looking for values, uh, understanding the values of others, and then beginning a conversation from that place. And they've been doing some really interesting work with that around climate change in Alberta where you know, there are conversations that need to happen, not just with all of us that are like, oh yeah, we're all super keen, but people who aren't. And so the place to start a conversation is in that values place. The, the 
question I have, so as a psychologist, I always say like people almost never come into counseling to do like proactively, you know, spontaneous growth work. Uh, probably Hillary does, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, most people don't. And so, you know, people come in to counseling because something's, you know, crashing in on them and they're looking for a way to address it. And I think particularly for us in, in North America and other parts of the world that have been and continue to be privileged uh, to not experience, I mean, we're experiencing climate change, but it's not in our face in the same way it is in, in lots of other parts of the world. So how do we make it real to people? Because people, a, a, a study in BC recently, and I, you probably know more about it than I do, but you know, was talking about the barriers to climate action, self-efficacy, feeling like you can make a difference, values alignment, um, you know, having something concrete to do, so even knowing what to do in that place. Um, and so, and, and, and having it be real to you as an individual and as your family. And one of the number one barriers was uh, competing priorities, which we see in the electoral discussions as well. So somehow we have to figure out a way of making this very real to people that where it's not that real. Yes, it's climate change. And we see kids, you know, you know, you might be impressed by the strikes, but that doesn't necessarily translate into action. And in fact, it often doesn't, the research shows. So how do we make this real? to people for whom it is not real and who have who bear a large responsibility for creating the problem, I mean, collectively, not getting into blame, but I mean, just in terms of our own footprint on the planet, how do we make it real for us in ways that we haven't managed to do with lots of other issues around poverty, homelessness, <laughs> count, the, count the things? So I, I don't know what the answer is, but I think that is a critical part of what we need to be doing to make, it, and it builds from a number of things that you've said, so I'd be interested. <coughs> Thank you, Robin, very much. One of the things we've been experimenting with, and I'll try to get back to your simple question a little later on, um, is experimenting with visuals. Uh, Rob can talk to his visualizations, and they're real-world visuals. But what we've been experimenting with um, is, is visuals. A picture is worth a thousand words, connecting heart and, and head through trying to link to art and beauty. I mean, it, there's nothing more beautiful than that. And if somehow you can use that to get to both people's heart as well as their head, because then that, that leads to greater action than if you're just appealing intellectually. So you, we've got to link, I can speak now as a, a part of the research community, we've got to link our research to action. One of the things we started to do, and we've been successful with our website now reaching 25 to 35-year-olds, 35, 35 is to you never bring up a problem without a solution. So that then, and there's so much happening. There's so many innovations. I, I mean, there's just, uh, and then, then there's so much myth, misinformation out there. I just learned from some younger colleagues of mine who are doing energy efficiency and greenhouse gas reduction mo uh, modeling across the country. You know who's leading the way in, the, in 15 cities across this country? Edmonton. That's not our image of Alberta, right? Or Alberta's really dragging us all down, et cetera, et cetera. So there's all this good stuff happening on the ground, and it's just not seeing the light of day. And so we've got to become better communicators through the language we use, how we communicate, where we communicate, and when we communicate. And to make our research policy relevant, which means being able to, as well, communicate in language that policymakers and decision makers will understand. So that's not using post postmodernism, which is one of the sort of theoretical constructs we have. But we've really got to concentrate on how we as researchers can move people in the community to action. I'm just going to add a little bit here, because I do want to uh, talk with you, Robin, a bit, address a little bit of what you've said. and it's. Uh, usually the most displeasing thing that I do say, because I know I look all happy and joyful, but, uh, and I have a real affinity for darkness. Uh, you know, I love this season where the shadows are lengthening and darkness comes early and stays late. But in terms of psychology, I like the darkness because I think that's the place things are born and gestate. I think we have done a poor job of allowing ourselves uh, to see grief and despair as a competency a human competency, not a pathology, but in effect, it's, our, it's an indicator of how much we love 
this place, how much we love to be a part of planet. And I think that even though things aren't in our face, our waters aren't rising here noticeably, and you know we're not having, strangely in this bubble, we don't have you know extreme weather events yet. Um, I would say that uh, if we were given our, if we give ourselves enough time and the kind of um, invitations to feel into uh, you know, our humanness and what's going on, that there's not one person in this room who isn't suffering from some despair right now, some grief about what's going on in the planet. And I think that is an entry point. That is a, an entry point for discussion, for learning how to bring our emotional selves with our beautiful rational minds in a more conciliatory way of learning. Because we've for too long, lopsidedly favored, uh, you know, the hegemon of the mind. And we, we can't think our way out of this. We need to also bring our feelings, that, because that's what's going to activate us. That's what motivates us to do something, is when we're really moved, emoted, to do something different. And, I, and I, so I see grief as a competency. I, I think it should be something that's actually in our learning outcomes. And there are beautiful, elegant ways to be able to allow people to express their grief and their despair, starting with gratitude and presence in the face of difficulty. Because just like after a good cry, the scales fall from your eyes and you can actually see the world with new eyes and for a time feel actively hopeful. But this is a cyclical... Uh, system of human nature and we haven't allowed ourselves to go dark or collapse or to let go of old ways of being we medicate depression for the most part we say we don't want you to feel that well I'm interested in us feeling that feeling everything so we can come around and reorganize ourselves and come out in, in a, a, a different way of uh, you know bringing what we know and transcending into the next iteration of how we'll be human. But I think it's necessary to bring our full human selves. And I, I think uh, epistemologically, we've failed to bring the whole human uh, in many ways. Although Royal Roads is doing a fine job. <laughs> okay. I would yeah. say for that that I think in many ways climate change, if you want to extend the psychology ana you know, analogy, is psycho climate change is a symptom. We're, we're perpetually exactly. addressing symptoms in our collective society <laughs> culture. And we're addressing climate change, not that we shouldn't be addressing and reducing, but it's a symptom, and it's a symptom of a much larger problem. Right. And perception problem. we're constantly going at the symptoms as though we're addressing the problem, and I don't think we are. What's the problem? I think our, our perception, a crisis of our perception that we could be separate. Perception, connection, right. our, our, be separate our, and do all that. our yeah. relationship with nature and who, how we think of ourselves as not a species. I think there's our, our economic systems that are only going to survive, only do survive, based on consumption. I mean, we just saw the NBA, I mean, it's a horrific example, but you know, it's like, well, money is more important than democracy, apparently, because we still want to have our shows shown in, you know, so I think those are the problems. Because we're still colonialists in our mind. We haven't moved to community member. We haven't moved from manipulator to participator. We're still in the same mindset with a new, sorry, this is the wor worst way to say it, same shit, different day. You know, we're just recreating these new, improved ways of being when we haven't gotten to the crux of the problem, which is we haven't allowed... Uh, for this deep separation to be mended, and uh, okay. anyway, sorry, I'm going <laughs> to I'm going to cut cut off what's an interesting line of discussion. But Vanessa's hey, got a, hi, an online I've question. Got a, yeah, I've got a question from Pornima, who's uh, joining us via live stream. Um, she says, as academics, we ourselves contribute to the climate crisis. Our conferences, workshops, and seminars create a lot of climate change problems. Can we start by setting examples? in academic tourism. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd love to jump into that one because um, I think this is uh, something that, um, you know, I mean, I, I feel very conflicted. We, we tackle a fair bit, but uh, it's true. I mean, as um, uh, academics, we contribute to it, but at the same time, too, we also have the space to be able to figure out different ways of doing conferences and workshops. 
there is a value to have this face-to-face -face, uh, meeting. Uh, same time, too, we have a lot of tools to be able to connect people quite well virtually. So um, what we've done a couple times for one, a, um, uh, a workshop that we did around this idea of rethinking what growth and progress means, um, we have these, uh, we, we did it in kind of a node style where we'd have partner communities uh, in various cities across Canada, and there was one in the United States. Um, they would have their own sort of discussion roundtables. Uh, we'd have a discussion in this room here, and then we'd meet once again through blue jeans. So there was a sort of like, interesting face-to-face -face and virtual dynamic. And we did it again for our climate change, uh, um, our recent like climate change workshop as well. So it's, it's the idea of saying that let's just not experiment with the ideas, but experiment with ways of doing it and actually just see um, how they work, um, how we can actually move away from carbon intensive uh, ways of interacting. I mean, we are researchers, so this can be part of our research uh, um, agenda and our focus. Yeah, I think one of our failures too is we haven't we haven't developed what are the new stories, what are the new narratives because we are we get our purpose and meaning through the stories we tell ourselves and we tell each other, um, and some of those new stories and also telling those stories in provocative ways. If people can't see uh, the ways forward, then we're never going to move forward. So we've been blogging and arguing extensively that what we need in this country to move from where we are now to a carbon nuclear economy by 2030, our, our high-level task force that develops transition strategies to show Canadians what the various scenarios are. That's the reason why, and there are important critical uh, policy, public policy questions to be asked. Exactly how much oil and gas do we still need in order to heat our homes till we move to the carbon neutral economy? Um, how, what about stranded assets? What, how do we not leave any one province uh, behind? All of these questions we can answer, but we haven't begun the critical conversations, nor are we asking the hard questions. Let's bring the elephant into the room. Got one last question from the online uh, audience from Runa Das. Do individuals have a place in multi-level governance models or governance more generally speaking? Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> My elder. <Yeah. laughs> My mentor. Yeah. I think mel uh, mentor is better than elder. You think so? Does elder yeah. connotate age? No, no. I That's didn't take it that way. Old. I'd like to be, yeah, I'd, I, I wouldn't mind being an elder now. I, yeah, I think you're beyond mentoring, if you don't mind my saying. Uh, uh, of course, it, it, multi level government. Uh, governance also means every every individual counts. Uh, this may be provocative. Every one of us can make a difference, but not every one of us wants to lead. We all have a role to play, even if it's moving that worm, even if it's picking up a, instead of just not having any garbage on your own private property, think enlarge your community. My uh, doctoral advisor, when I was studying at McGill, when we were walking uh, across the campus, would pick up garbage, and I think, oh God, who's looking? I really don't want to be doing this. Well, you know what? Now I understand what he was all about. So I pick up garbage at Royal Roads now and again when I've got, I make the time. So the individual counts, the individual voice, vote counts, and we're just not making our voices heard. Speak up and speak out every single time you can. Send an email. Go to uh, electoral candidates' meetings and ask the questions. Bring up, we've got five policy agendas that are, are, are designed for decision makers and all Canadians. We have developed a biodiversity conservation agenda for all Canadians. It's all got concrete steps. Go, take it, show up, go to your municipal councilor and say, here's a biodiversity agenda that has been developed for this country. Do you know about biodiversity? What are you doing about biodiversity? Is your local official community plan got a biodiversity strategy in it? Does it have a food strategy in it? Does it have a mitigation strategy in it? These are the questions we start. That's where the individual comes in at the local level and then connect up provincially and then nationally and then globally. The largest question is gonna be how to get a global governance system in place so that we're all moving in the, in the directions that we have to be moving. I'll just use an example from some of the work we, I, I do, the em, environmental contaminants. The Stockholm Convention on Persistent Organic Pollutants began with individual scientists showing that 
pollutants such as DDT, PCBs being used in uh, the tropics are being ending, ending up in the Arctic. The Canadian government took it up and then it ended up being an international protocol. So it started with individual scientists showing some of these impacts. So yeah, individuals can make it a difference all the way up to an international level. Uh, so uh, back to the individual and back to maybe society a little bit just briefly. I believe that we're living in a largely patho-adolescent society that we haven't, uh, in our society, we haven't created or maintained any many meaningful ceremonies or rites of passage so that we can actually grow up rather than just grow old. And we tend to be a society of having it all with no consequences, which is very adolescent. Uh, and so I think we have a lot of growing up to do to be able to take responsibility, to be able to show up in these ways. And I think that is also um, the beautiful possibility of us as individuals, as well as the work that we have to do. Uh, I think education is a beautiful place to mature ourselves as well. We don't say that in the brochure, <laughs> but I do think that this is also a way we can grow up rather than, as I say, simply grow old and just keep contributing to the problem. Well, at this point, uh, we are out of time. No. So, well, not... One, one last question. That's up to Vanessa. Are we going to... Sure. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'll put this question to the panel, including yourself, Dr. Noble, and actually everyone else in the room. Uh, first of all, I would like to say thank you to everybody here. Uh, it's amazing to be among uh, this group of people who are all working towards the same goal. Um, I appreciate everyone on the panel for sure, but I won't let us off easily without a challenge. Um, and uh, Dr. Dale, you mentioned the elephant in the room, and I feel like the elephant in the room in this institution is what this institution is doing. Uh, I feel like there's a deep greenwashing going on here in the institution. I know within my program itself, uh, 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 faculty have been burnt out by the pushback and by the resistance from the institution overall. So I would challenge this program and the staff and faculty here to really turn this institution around and stop talking about the externality, stop talking about the Arctic and what's happening down in Brazil. It's like right here, underneath our feet, we have this opportunity and we're not taking advantage of it. Um, so I would put that question out to you five, actually, on, on what you would like to see change in this institution and how you would go about making those changes. Okay, I'm coming in. Because uh, I have to leave soon anyways. Bone density test, age. Um, you know, Kelly, um, I think we all come with partial knowledge. I think it's easy to grab on to things and say, well, this is the way it is at Royal Roads. I would have a different perspective than you would have as a student. I've been here for 14 years. I've worked in, you know, started continuing studies and then moved into the faculty side of the house. I have a, a lot of uh, depth here, but I also only have a partial story. I see mostly positive things going on here. I see lots of room for improvement always. Uh, I take a lot of that as res I'm responsible for as a person. Uh, we had a beautiful uh, day uh, where our president declared that we are part of the climate emergency. I mean, that in itself is a, a statement that is not, uh, you know, simple lip service. We are activated now to work on these, uh, you know, areas that are around transportation and around education. And uh, I want to start a production farm here at Royal Roads. And for the first time in my history, I feel like it's possible. So I think we're all working on the, in the small ways we can and institutionally we still have to grow up we're in our 20s you know we have a lot of things that we're still wrestling with but thank goodness we're wrestling with them I want to be part of this place that while not perfect we're interested in you know turning toward the things that were that need our attention and we do do that as well as run the plane you know as fly the plane we're running programs and doing a lot while we're changing the engine so it's it's tricky 
Uh, it's easy to say, you know, what are you going to do about it? I think we are always doing things about it, and sometimes we do better than other times. But uh, I don't think anyone's being complacent uh, here and now. I, d I don't see people sitting with their feet up, smoking big cigars and wearing fezzes, you know, hanging out in their office <laughs> with a pet monkey. You know, we're all very busy, <laughs> and we're all concerned whether we're going to get this right or not. I think we're going to get it, but whether it's right or not, you know, we're just, we're in the thick of it. So and I, I think, I think we're, if I could just uh, add here as uh, director, the new director of the school, uh, I think we've never been in a better position. We are in a state of flux. We are in a considerable period of change. We have a new president who I think is a very decent human being and who's deeply committed to reconciliation in the full sense of the world. We're, we have a beautiful new building. I encourage you to come to the Sherman Gen building. And I, I, as a school, I, I don't think we're burnt out and frustrated. And I, any of my professorial colleagues, we've never been as together or as collegial. There, there are major changes occurring in the MEM program and changes threatening to people. There will be some changes made, but uh, I think there's never been such a wonderful opportunity as we have now. Are our operations as sustainable as they could be? No, but we're working hard towards it as a, as a school and both as a university. Uh, it's just, uh, and it's one of the most beautiful campuses in the country to be, be privileged enough to work and study with. So, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty confident. So I'm a bit surprised, Kelly, by what you were saying, so. It's your research, isn't it, Kelly? Yeah, It anyway. is, isn't it? Come on, admit it. It's what you want to write your thesis on, right? Yeah. Come on. It's okay. Uh, Sorry. Well, I guess maybe to use a specific example of that, what about fossil fuel investments? Or even oh, totally. Or totally agree with you. Go to the president. Already, <laughs> but that's, like, for one student to go to the president, like, <coughs> where's, where's the faculty on pushing this? It's, or even the, the conference that was uh, six months ago for the universities that are tackling climate change. I didn't see railroads list uh, of attendance on, on there. Like, why are we not? We have this fantastic program, this fa fantastic faculty and students. Why are we not leading this charge in North America? We have declared ourselves to be a climate leader. I mean, your cohort could self-organize and write to the president and not in a blaming or shaming way and say, have you, cons have you got a policy of fossil fuel div divestment? And here are X number of universities who have divested. Uh, we, can, we work hard as a school within the university as a whole, but, you know, we're, uh, we're a bureaucracy like other institutions. So to make substantial change, that's what governance is all about. It's pressure from the outside to the inside and coalescing at the same time, same place, space, and, and time, uh, pressure from the inside. So there's one thing that would be helpful. If you've got other suggestions like that, because the other thing that's so fascinating when you study systems, but you're living within the system, you all, all you sometimes and often forget the small steps that you can be making as well. Mm -hmm. You know, because it's pretty hard to see your boxes and to lift the lid sometimes. The other thing to keep in mind is that every initiative, regardless of what it is, has to have somebody that's going to champion it, right? And not everything we champion is a big national scale thing, right? Most of my research revolves around what grade ones think science is. Okay, so Mickey has another <coughs> name known as Dr. Blasto. Could you just briefly talk about your kindergarten program? Um, I've been running as a key kindergarten to grade five outreach program here at Royal Roads for the better part of the last 15 years. And for the most part, until we moved to the Sherman Gen, I'm not entirely convinced that the executive knew that we were doing anything. Um, but we bring uh, kids from uh, elementary schools from three districts and about seven, element, seven or eight elementary school classes a year to have a full day of experience doing lab and field work with the uh, Bachelor of Science students. And one of the things that falls out of that are little things that if I say what some of those things are, you're going to think, well, that's not all that significant. So one of our things that falls out of that is we have made the list for things I want to be when I grow up from the kindergarten class. So they want to be firemen and policemen and pirates and scientists and ballerinas. We're on the list. 
Okay, if you don't think when you're five that that's something you can do, you're never going to consider it when you're 15 and you're changing your mind about what your elective is going to be just in time to, to take your prerequisite courses to go to university. I've been running this program long enough that one of the high schools that's in our, in one of the catchment zones that our, our elementary schools are in, um, over half of the grade 11 and grade 12 biology classes came to visit us at least once. Now, not all those kids are going to grow up to be scientists, but a lot of them are going to grow up to be a whole lot more science literate than our generation is, our grandparents, you know, their grandparents are. And that makes it a lot easier to start some of these discussions. Mickey, I'm going to interject and I'm going to say the way Mickey started today is one of those acts. The way she didn't put up the message, the video of welcome, traditional welcome, the way she spoke about it because she's on this land and has gratitude for this land, that's also how these changes are made. So yay, Mickey. Thank you, Mickey. Okay. So we've had a lot of great, great conversations today. Be subversive. Continue the conversation, <laughs> right? If nobody talks about it, nobody's going to do anything about it. Okay? Thank you. Thank you.